everyone. Um, I'm Christy Hake. I'm Chair of Biological Sciences at Northern Kentucky University. And I'm going to give you an introduction today um, on our data mining and visualization transdisciplinary team um, and what we've done to investigate retention in the STEM disciplines. Okay. So first of all, a little background on Northern Kentucky University. Um, we have 15,000 students with about 2,000 faculty and staff and we're 48 years old. And why that's important is because it really makes working across disciplines and across divisions really easy. Um, in fact, our president likes to use the word nimble, and it's really an accurate representation of what it's like to work at NKU. Um, we just recently went through a strategic planning process, and one of the priorities that were identified was this idea of transdisciplinarity. And so you can see represented on this slide all of the different groups who have come together to work on this project, um, faculty from, and students from the College of Informatics, the College of Arts and Sciences, um, our Center of Excellence, the Center for Integrative Natural Science and Mathematics, the Kentucky Center for Mathematics, and we're also going to talk about two large program grants that we have from the National Science Foundation. And those program grants are specifically designed um, to focus on STEM retention and recruitment. For those of you that know the NSF acronyms, well, we have two STEM grants and one STEP grant. We'll talk more about that. So as the teams came together uh, to focus on retention and recruitment in STEM, um, of course, some team members were in the College of Informatics, incidentally, one of the few colleges of informatics in the country. We realized that we had a, a great niche here that we could probably fill um, in data mining and visualization, and that's really what prompted a lot of this. So I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Bethany Bowling, and she's going to talk about the uh, FORCE project. Hi, I'm Bethany Mulling, and I'm a faculty member in the biology department here at NKU. I'm also the PI on the FORCE grant, which is a STEP grant funded through NSF started in 2010. These are a number of our retention activities that we uh, have taken part in as part of Project FORCE, an undergraduate research program, social events and social media efforts, and peer-led undergraduate study sessions uh, led by peer leaders known as STEM ambassadors. These are probably not unlike many of the activities that others of you have implemented. Now this slide is kind of fun. It shows some of the different ways that we've weaved STEM uh, social events to help students integrate into the culture at NKU. It includes a STEM welcome event, night at the beginning of the fall semester, monthly STEM pizza suppers, and that was the Halloween STEM pizza supper there with the pizza slice with the pie hat on a fall bonfire, ice cream social, anything that's helping get the students integrated into their department and meet other students and meet some of the peer leaders to help them progress through the program. So the project, obviously, we started in 2010. We needed to measure success. And along with our external evaluator, we worked with institutional research at NKU to obtain the necessary data. And in the line graph and table above, you see the retention rates of students that have participated in the different aspects of the project compared to a group, the STEM comparison group, with equivalent ACT scores. First, the first spring cohort shows, uh, or the first spring under that uh, uh, column in the table there, you'll see that you're seeing the, the uh, retention rate of those students that started in cohorts 2009 through 2013 that participated in our different activities as well as the STEM comparison group. And so you can see that as the years have gone by, that third spring, fourth fall, et cetera, have lower numbers of participants. So you don't see um, quite as many numbers there, and that's why there's some fluctuation. But in general, decreasing retention much better retention rates for those students that have participated in our course activities. We have run into various obstacles in measuring the retention of the participants as well as having um, comparison group or a quasi-control group, and we always found ourselves asking more questions. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Hake to talk more about SOAR program. So 
So Project SOAR is an STEM grant. Um, our first one was started in 2008. We were awarded the second one in 2012, and it brought in a total of $1.2 million to NKU, mostly in scholarship money. The purpose of the program, as I mentioned earlier, recruit, retain, educate, and graduate academically talented SOAR scholars who have financial need and then who enter the workforce or graduate school. And the program is made up of um, a set of um, activities. Uh, first of all, we have intensive and intrusive advising. Uh, we have many learning communities. We do all kinds of social activities. And we have uh, two courses that the students take, a total of three credit hours. So it isn't a, a large part of the load, but they take it as freshmen. And these um, students, SOAR scholars, uh, take this during their freshman year. Um, the important part about the SOAR program compared to the FORCE program is that SOAR manages about 20 students a year, whereas the FORCE program covers all the students in the STEM discipline. At this point, that's about 1,800 students. So the SOAR program has recently taken on a second cohort, um, and so we're now looking at about 40 students a year. And in this next slide gives you kind of the, the take-home message here um, of the success of the program. Um, if you look at retention in the STEM disciplines after the first year at NKU, it's about 65%. If you look at the retention of SOAR scholars after the first year, that's this first row right there, it's between 75 and 85 percent. And not all SOAR students stay in the STEM disciplines, but they do stay at NKU. And you can see the third row there, we have some years even where we've had 100 percent retention. Um, interestingly, if you go to the bottom table, you will also see um, retention, excuse me, graduation rates uh, where you, you just look at normal NKU students, it doesn't matter the discipline, um, and the four-year graduation rate is 13%. The first cohort of SOAR scholars, 47% graduated in four years. So for us, we realize that SOAR is a very successful program, and we're trying to figure out ways on how to scale up. So that leads to the purpose of this project, and I guess the inception of the project. We have data from FORCE, we have data from SOAR, we have some departmental data from our STEM disciplines, and we have some institutional data, as you can see on this screen, showing NKU's retention rate in the high 60% range. Um, and putting that all together, we realized that we needed to do a little more inspection and figure out, using the tools available to us, how we could improve our retention rate. So, what data sets do we have available to try and figure out what's going on? Um, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. We wanted to lever leverage, again, the two main tools that we have available to us. Data mining, we're going to hear later from um, a couple of data scientists, um, and also data visualization. We wanted to also dispel some myths. For example, all of XX, I'll say biology majors, changed to YY, which a myth here was that they went to psychology. You'll see data later that that's actually not the case. So when we first started this out, the first place we went was to talk to our president, who actually gave us a $7,000 grant um, so we could fund undergraduate student researchers. Now, I want to remind you of the data that we saw when Dr. Bowling was presented and the success of the FORCE program. And you saw that students who participated in the FORCE program actually did really well in terms of retention. But if you look at this graph, you'll see that there's still a whole lot of questions that need to be answered in terms of why aren't we retaining students um, the way that we'd like to. And so, again, this data has prompted a lot of questions for us. And we pulled together this team to try and answer these questions. So first of all, we have our data management and IR, institutional research liaisons. Um, we have a person on our team. Um, a lot of her focus actually is on in institutional review board. Um, we spent a lot of time making sure we have the appropriate human subjects protections. 
We have data mining and statistics people, um, Drs. Nolan and Lancaster, and the student Casey Kotnick, who you'll hear from later. And then uh, the data visualization team, myself, uh, Dr. Maureen Doyle, and student Nathaniel Hudson, who will share some of their data. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Madura Kulkarni, who's going to talk about um, the data, the institutional research, and IRB. Hello, my name is Madura Kulkarni. I'm the Assistant Director of our Center for Integrated Math and Science and Mathematics, which is our STEM center on campus. Um, and I'm just going to go quickly over um, our IR and IRB. Uh, issues, uh, things that we've gone through. So, um, first, our data sources. We've been working very closely with our uh, Office of Institutional Resources to provide us data on things like term by term enrollment of students, um, graduation data, metrics such as their high school and undergraduate GPAs, test scores, uh, etc., uh, demographics such as their age, their parents' education, such things. Um, and then we also hope to get um, their survey results if they participated in the NESI and BESI surveys, which are uh, administered to first year students and graduating seniors. Um, we also hope to get some data from a survey that we recently implemented called MapWorks from our Office of Student Affairs. Um, now, of course, when you're working with sensitive data like these, uh, you have to take several precautions. So, and obtain proper approval. So, as Dr. Haig mentioned, um, we have been working closely with our Office of Institutional Research to make sure we're complying with their um, rules and regulations. Um, and we have gone through several cycles of IRB approval as we change our methods and things to make sure that our human centers are protected. Um, and we've taken several precautions to protect the data. So, for example, um, we, we do have student researchers involved, and we don't we limit the access that they have. Um, and all of our data is stored in um, protected folders on our uh, university um, system. They are not stored on individual computers. We don't email them around. Um, and those files are password protected. Um, also, we de-identified all the data and so that we don't know who the students are, and anybody that might see the data sets won't be able to tell who they are. Um, and when we do our analysis on the data, um, we make sure that we don't um, report any results for cells fewer than six people. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Mark Lancaster, um, sorry, to my to student Casey Kotnick, to start talking about some of the work we've done. Hi, my name is Casey Kotnick, and I'm a math and statistics um, student here at NKU. And um, my work um, was looking at term by term um, movement of students through their time at NKU, and we were looking to understand and dispel myths um, regarding how students move. Um, between colleges and departments from term to term. So to do this, I had a data set of all first-time, full-time students at NKU. And um, on the screen, you see an example of a, transi a transition matrix, which gives the probabilities of movement um, for the college that each student started in in their first year um, and the probability that they ended up in each respective college. And um, this is particularly useful because it shows how many students for each college ended up being not registered after their first year. University programs denotes undeclared students, so 1.5% were undeclared by the end, by the beginning of their second year, and 29.7% of those students who started in arts and sciences were not in KU at the start of the second year. So, 
On this screen, you see the complete transition matrices from year one to year two, and then from year one to year three. Um, this highlights students um, particularly who didn't return to NKU, and we see that informatics, both from year one to year two and year one to year three, have the highest retention rate within their college. Also, this supports research that students who declare a major are more likely to persist in KU than those that do not declare a major. And now you see a small snippet of a similar transition matrix, but this time broken down between the department. And again, academic devising is representative of students who are undeclared. Um, so again, 49.9% .9 of students that started out undeclared at the beginning of their first year were undeclared going into their second year. And this dispels myths that um, chemistry students switch to either psychology or STEM majors, and we actually see that they're most likely to go into um, a business discipline. And the myth that CS students are more likely to transfer to CIT majors than CIT to CS was actually confirmed with this analysis. And now I'm handing it over to Dr. Lancaster. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Mark Lancaster, and I'm uh, new to the team this year. Uh, I'm working uh, with uh, Casey Kotnick on uh, additional uh, aspects involving data mining. Uh, the beginning of the, the analysis was uh, based off of previous work that was done by uh, Dr. Maureen Doyle, where an initial and formal analysis was done uh, just looking at parents' education, uh, looking at undeclared majors. Uh, that was in primarily in R. Uh, to actually see, you know, uh, what type of uh, impact it had on graduation rates. And what we found actually was confirmed with a later uh, logistic regression, and I'll do that on the next slide. So uh, the additional things that we're working on, we're still waiting on some additional data from student affairs that will go more into detail how students are budgeting and using their time, such as their uh, uh, commuting. Uh, difficulties perhaps, and uh, there's also an additional analysis that's being done by uh, another data scientist uh, as part of the, uh, their data science class. So getting into the uh, actual analysis, uh, the first one that I looked at uh, with Casey was uh, a regional analysis. We were looking at three counties that uh, uh, Northern Kentucky uh, University serves Campbell, Boone, and uh, Kenton counties. And so those were the, the ones primarily uh, identified as a one, all the other uh, counties were zero. And uh, when we looked at that analysis, uh, several variables uh, were uh, not important uh, in a um, uh, statistically significant setting, 5% significance. Uh, in particular, the, uh, the county, the um, fact that they were either declared or undeclared, and their father's education uh, didn't uh, matter as much as mother's education, their ACT score, their uh, high school GPA, and uh, if they were a full or uh, part-time student on this. And so uh, the nice thing about this is that we're able to look at some social indications the high school and the ACT scores uh, uh, and the, uh, the parents' education all feed into uh, the, uh, the importance of those aspects when you're looking at graduation rate. And what we're trying to add to it are things involving uh, economics. Do they have uh, grants or scholarships? Uh, we think that that would be important and aspects involving time. And so right now for that, we really only have the full and part-time info and the county that they are from as an indication of perhaps, are they going to be uh, commuters or are they actually coming and living on campus uh, on there? Uh, 
though other analysis that we did that had basically the same results is a, a larger analysis where we looked at Appalachian versus non-Appalachian uh, region. And just like the county analysis, that really was not an important aspect of it. Uh, and typically when you're looking at Kentucky, uh, Appalachia is a big region to consider in terms of both uh, medical aspects and educational aspects. And so uh, in, uh, in summary, mother's education, ACT score, high school GPA all had positive aspects uh, toward improving uh, the chances of graduation. And uh, the, uh, the detriment, if you were actually a part-time student, it ended up hurting your chances at uh, graduation. So all of those uh, definitely um, make sense of their, their, their sort of reasonable um, outcomes based on the analysis. And really all we're doing now is continuing the data mining for the 2007-2008 uh, uh, group, and we'll be testing the hypotheses with latter data that we haven't looked at yet. Um, in the, the next slides, we'll turn it over to, uh, oh, one more, oh, sorry about that. So for the, the main data takeaway on this, uh, going back and looking at uh, what Casey and I have done, uh, some myths actually were in, in the, the true setting. CS majors were much more likely to switch uh, to CIT than not. Uh, on the other hand, some myths were actually myths that uh, chemistry majors are much more likely to switch to business than uh, the biological sciences. And then um, some questions prompted from this work include, you know, do uh, students come back uh, if they actually uh, were to leave a particular major? And uh, Nathaniel will have uh, more results uh, related to that. Uh, where this is going is that these results are probably going to be useful for the new budget model where uh, the actual departments are going to have much more uh, control over their individual budgets. And so there will be uh, important things to consider when we start looking at seeing student movement between the different degree programs. So now I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Marine Below and then Daniel uh, to uh, continue. Hi, my name is Maureen Doyle. I'm an associate professor of computer science. And um, me, along with Christy, Dr. Christy Haight and Nathaniel Hudson, worked on visualization. I'm going to present some work that was done by a graduate student. And um, I want to think one of the main things you're going to be taking home from this is that we have the two teams we meet every week. We have the statisticians and um, the number crunchers, and then we have the visualization people. We're trying to inform each other, and a question comes up, and come, which tool can we use to answer it and proceed forward? So we're going to show you some of the visualizations that came from ideas that we have that have then informed additional work that we've done. So the um, first, I hit the wrong space bar. So, go okay. back. Is this the right one? Okay. So this work was done by Pam Reichel Feldrich. She was um, a master's student in computer science at the time. And we were curious exactly where our student population um, was coming from. And she um, was able to map the locations with the size of the dot is where the majority of our students come from. So you can see here, we really are predominantly a regional campus. Most of our students are from the area. And this was of interest to the work that Mark had done because his initial review of the data had shown that students that came from our main three counties that we serve in Kentucky, Campbell, Kenton, and Boone, actually coming from those counties with his initial analysis had been an indicator of not graduating. And so when he delved further, um, and we took into account the parents' high school education, their high school GPA and ACT, we found that that was not an indicator. And so we've had some interesting journeys with some of our interim results. And today we're presenting results in a form that has IR has looked at so they're, they're, we're, they're pretty stable. Um, so in here you can see that most of them are from the northern part of Kentucky. Um, and the, the, what we wanted to look at with the mapping data and the number of maps done was is there anything um, associated to how far the students might travel or how far um, if they're living on campus or is there a school district that might be an indicator of not succeeding at school? We were not able to establish the latter. Fortunately, we didn't want to. But one um, hypothesis 
that was fielded around was that how far a student commutes. We have 2,000 beds and 15,000 students. And one theory um, we had was that if a student is commuting for an hour up and back every day, they may not stay. And so initially when we looked at this, the results from this visualization map, let me explain it to you a little bit, the darker the green, the more students there are. So if you look at the three counties up around the start of Northern Kentucky are the darkest green, and that's where most of our students are coming from. Counties that are in yellow or near yellow either had fewer than six students um, or no students. So the size of the pink circle are the number of students who do not return to NKU. So a large pink circle is poor. I will point out that this visualization was not done with data scientists and we will update our colors in the future, um, but we do enjoy purple. And um, <laughs> Sorry, about, we already were criticized by Mark. Um, so, but what was interesting is I had expected the circles to get larger as you get to an hour away and that isn't what we saw. But what you can note is right around those three counties around NKU, the counties immediately around that, so the area where students might drive a half an hour or 40 minutes, the circles do increase. So the retention, we are losing students as um, the further they have to drive. And what we were able to do is Dr. Haik and I are on um, a project with Student Affairs, and we were able to get questions put into the freshman and sophomore survey of how, far do, how long do you spend in the car every day. And so we will be doing future analysis to see if that's having an impact on retention and what we can do about that. Um, so this was the, the information from the maps. So now um, what we're going to do is talk about visualization as a tool, and I'll be turning it over to Dr. Christy Haig to talk about that. Thank you. So for me, this was really exciting to delve into this whole idea of visualization. Um, and so I worked with uh, Dr. Doyle and data science student who you're going to hear from in, um, in just a few minutes, Nathaniel Hudson, um, who incidentally is also a source scholar. Um, I had to get them in there. Um, and so we spent a lot of time recognizing that our visualization needed to be both flexible and clear. Um, and we're going to take you through some of the really ugly ones and we're going to take you through some of the great ones. Um, the most important thing is we needed to understand how to represent a large and diverse data set um, around student retention. And so, um, okay, there we go. So the first thing we did, like any normal college student does, is we went to Google and we started Googling things. And so if you can see the image I put down at the bottom, it's okay if you can't tell exactly what that is. But the basic idea was, um, is we Googled visual, data visualization and open source. And we started just looking at the different images that popped up, thinking about the types of data that we had. And we spent a whole lot of time on scrap paper and with colored uh, markers trying to draw things out, seeing if it made sense for us to take the next step, looking at um, the types of um, open field software that was available. So um, I've included on this slide here some, some interesting links. Uh, the d3js.org, actually we're going to, Nathan is going to talk about that more. That was very useful to us. The open data tools was a very good link. Um, we also spent a little bit of time doing Tableau, but when we got into more complexity and looking at more factors involved in retention than just say, um, geography, um, we found that Tableau was actually quite limited. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Nathaniel Hudson now, um, our computer science, data science double major, and he's going to talk about the different languages and libraries that we use um, for data visualization. All right, hello, I'm Nathaniel Hudson, and I am a student in the College of Informatics and a Solar Scholar, as Dr. Christy Haig mentioned. Um, some of the technologies that I use to kind of implement some of the visualizations that we had decided on after we had many sketches on scratch paper and highlighters was 
I decided to use two languages in order to incorporate that. So Python was the main language that I used to go through the data because a lot of it was messy. It wasn't consistent. So I had to go through and use that in order to normalize it and also so that I could parse it into other like data files like CSV. Um, JavaScript, which is a scripting language that's, made, that's used in web browsers, that was used alongside the D3 API because it's written in JavaScript. So that was mainly used just so that I could incorporate those um, visualizations. So, and with that, the libraries that I use in those languages, D3 was for JavaScript, and it allows you to have data visualization in, jo in JavaScript so that you can make stunning visualizations with it. XLRD was a library that I used so that I could transform Excel spreadsheet files, which is what I was given, and manipulate the data in that through Python. And then, finally, the, the tool that I, was, that I was most happy to find was Parallel Sets, which is an interactive visualization tool that creates a very dynamic visualization that you can actually manipulate. And I will go into that later and give you a live demonstration. This first visualization is called a Senki. So the way that it sets up is in the first column on the far left, you will see the different colleges of our university. CAS means College of Arts and Sciences. UP means University Programs, which represents undergraduate, no, undergraduate students who are undeclared. Um, COI represents informatics. CB represents business. CEH represents educational human services, and HP represents health, health programs. So on the far left, you'll notice that you'll see CAS1. So what that means is these are students starting off in the College of Arts and Sciences in their first semester. And then if we follow that bar all the way to the second column, you will see CAS2. And that little empty block that does not continue at, at the bottom of CAS2, that's the, that's the students that do not show back up. So the reason why, this is a very helpful visualization. It was the best one that we found early on into our research. The, few, the, the issues with it is that it's kind of hard to figure out what, what, those un, what, those under, what the students that drop or show up as not registered, that little empty block, it's hard to track them. And that was the biggest problem that we had with that. And it's not very dynamic. It's That's pretty much all you get. The only functionality you get beyond just looking at it is that you can highlight the different bands. So with that in mind, we were able to find, with a little bit more research, we found this tool. And this is the parallel sets visualization that I talked about earlier. So. In nature, it's very similar to this, the same key visualization in that it shows first fall, second fall, third fall, fourth fall, and you can follow CAS and you can see where they're going. But uh, when we get to the live demonstration, I will be able to show you about what makes this such a more powerful tool. And this is kind of the ugly side of parallel sets. It looks very confusing. But I assure you, it will make a lot more sense by the end of the demonstration because overall, this is a very powerful tool. And while this looks messy in a screenshot, you truly get to understand the power of this when you actually get to use it. So, you should have okay. the screen. Okay. All right, let's start your demo. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what we have here is we have the parallel sets visualization. We have the parallel sets program. It's open. So first we're going to go, we're going to open the overall student retention file that has all the different colleges. So let's start with first fall, second fall, and third fall third fall, and fourth fall. So this was the picture that I showed you earlier that was really messy and kind of confusing to look at. But what makes this so powerful is just how dynamic this tool is. So I can go over here 
And I can limit this to just look at College of Arts and Sciences in the first fall. So I'm going to bring this up here. So what we have now is we have, we are able to track the flow of students starting off in the arts, College of Arts and Sciences in their first fall. So if we go to this band, this is, these are all the people, the highlighted bands are the people that start off in College of Arts and Sciences in their first fall, continue to Arts and Sciences in their second fall. So then we can continue this band further and track the, the students that are going into Arts and Sciences for their third fall. And likewise, we can follow the students going into their fourth fall. However, as I talked about as a weakness in the Sankey visualization is that we don't really, we, with that visualization, we couldn't really tell where the, the non-registered students were going. That was a great, what looks so great about this tool is we can actually track that. So right here, this band, these are the students that after their first fall of being an arts and, arts and sciences student, they are not registered by the second fall. However, you notice all these bars of movement. So instead of just tracking and seeing who stay not registered, let's track people that come back to arts and sciences. So we're just going to come here. And then these are students that go from College of Arts and Sciences to not registered back to Arts and Sciences. And if we follow this bar even further, I'm, I'm getting there. There we go. So if we follow this bar even further, we have students that go from Arts and Sciences to not registered to Arts and Sciences for their third fall and then Arts and Sciences for their fourth fall. This is much more helpful for us because it lets us better track students if they come back or not. And it's very helpful when we're trying to analyze this data and see the retention of students. Because if they come back, that's not necessarily a failure on their part because that could be addressed to like a family issue or something like that. Now I would like to give a demonstration of another another data, another piece of data that we were able to get. And that would be at the departmental departmental level. So if we go to look at the biology department, we can go from first fall to second fall. So first of all are all the students starting off in bi the biological science department. This band represents people who stay in the biological sciences department in their second fall. This, this bar right here, this represents students stay, who start off in biological sciences and then go to health professions. And this bar shows biological sciences to marketing, economics, and sports business. The main issue with this um, visualization, and it was a main problem that I had to address in Python and normalization of the data, was that this visualization is very complex in nature, as you can imagine. And with all the different departments that we have, it can kind of overload and the program will just shut down if I have all the departments listed. So I had to go through and find the top the top departments that students in each department go to, and then any department. So like, for instance, if there's one student that starts off in biological sciences and then they transfer to philosophy or something like that, that would be represented as other because not a significant enough of my students transfer to it. So that was something that we had to we had to accommodate because it just simply won't be able to handle it. But it did give us some really key observations, like um, being able to affirm the myth that a lot of computer science students switch over to CIT. So the rest of it. And with this. This, these, this is the tracking of the biological sciences department students for fall one, two, three, and four. So these are the highlighted bars are the um, biological students that start off in the biological department and then they stay by their fourth fall, and that represents 16% of starting off, and those probably aren't the best numbers to hear, but <laughs> That, that's just what they are. And the, mo the most upsetting part about doing this research is seeing the not registered information come through. Mm -hmm. Because if we follow that, this is the chunk of people that start off in biological sciences and stay not registered and they never come back. And that accounts for 32% of all the students starting off in biological sciences. And if you have any 
if you would like to ask maybe for some requests after in the, after the seminar, just let me know and we can do that. Can you switch back to me? Thank you, Matina. We're going to be going back to the slide presentation. Yeah, but I can't see it. I can see it. Thanks. Where? Uh, I don't see it. It's not there. That's one, right? It's just as waiting. Sorry about that. Oh, so it's not. I got the wrong one. Hold on one second. Mm. Three. Is it three? three. Yes. There you go. Okay, sorry. All right. Well, thank you, Zephina and Melissa. Okay. Did I have the mouse? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so the takeaway from the visualization work uh, was that, first of all, it was a huge time commitment up front. None of us are visualization people. Um, and trying to figure out how we would want to present the data took quite a while. I'm a huge fan of the chord diagram, um, but no one understood it. And um, so there were visualizations that were presented that we would field with our team. And if no one understood it, we moved on to something else. The other thing from the visualization um, that came up were questions that then went back to the data analysis team. And, and again, this is the circuitous kind of research we're doing. We're trying to leverage the two to be able to answer and find out more information. So um, as I said before, it was um, from the maps, how long are the students commuting? And that informed it. And I'm going to talk about a project um, next. Uh, that came out from the data visualization, which was impacting our University 101, which is our introduction to college for our, unit, for our students. And it also provided a lot of results that was reassuring to some of us of students leaving the department and exploring different majors do come back. Um, it also provided uh, information, um, sadly, on the number of students that don't come back, um, but there was useful information in those visualizations. All right. Oops, wrong, wrong one again. Okay. So I want to give you an interesting tale of University 101. So last summer, Nathaniel um, spent the summer we were working together, and he came into my office and said, "Look at this." Um, I'd given him the data, and he was looking at different comparisons, and he said, "When you look at the number of students who have enrolled in our University 101, just as many we have 18% um, uh, leave um, who didn't take." University 101, and look at this, 18% who did leave. Isn't this fascinating? And, and, and I'm thinking, yes, we need to save money. Let's get rid of University 101. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so um, we decided we would examine what was going on with that. So just a little bit of background about this course. Our University 101, our intro to college, it's not required for incoming students. It also can be taken any semester. It's a one credit course and it can be taken whenever a student wants to. And interestingly, enrollment has been increasing, especially since 2012. And um, so we put this question based on um, Nathaniel's tinkering and looking at different kinds of amounts of data. We, we threw log this over to um, the data analysis team and said, what can you tell us about University 101? So, oops, <laughs> sorry. Um, so the first thing um, we did was when they looked at it, um, we shared it with institutional research. We had a meeting with them, and they said, oh, we know that. We found that a few years ago. However, that's you need to delve deeper into the data um, that you can't, you know, just because your statistics show that 18% don't return after the first year, and you could show that over the four years, that, that really isn't enough information, and you shouldn't be making any policy decisions on it. And they thought, OK, so A, we're not doing all the cutting edge work, but B, that was really good for us to know. So um, I'm going to give you the summary before I go over the data that we found. Um, so the, the, data, the statisticians and data scientists examined all the students since 2000. And um, what to see if there was who University 101, who benefited most from it, and in a way that we could, because we want to ask our advisors to recommend it to students who are most at risk. Because I think our biggest frustration is 
Um, many of us work on a number of retention issues. We put a lot of our own time into it, and we're not seeing that retention number budge overall for the whole school. And our projects and the students who participate in our projects are fantastic, but we would really like for it to reach more of our students. So we thought one leverage we can at least provide people is if you can encourage these particular students to study University 101, it, we, we may be able to see an uptick in our overall retention. So I'll give you the, the, the short answer, which I'm sure shocks many of you, is that don't eliminate, your, at least at NKU, our University 101. Um, it will not be a cost saving. I kept doing it. Sorry. So the confounding factors that we found that contributed um, to students benefiting from University 101 our students who have a low English ACT, this was the most significant factor, more than math ACT, which was, as STEM people, was very surprising to us. Um, being male, male students um, benefit from University 101 more than females. Students who have not declared a major also benefit from University 101. And for students majoring in marketing, nursing, or teacher's ed, they also um, it has a, a, it's a compounding factor to improve retention. And interestingly enough, teacher education is one of the programs that is a high enrollment, a high percentage of their students do take University 101. Um, so, we, so we found that. And I know that I, I am running a little bit over for questions. Um, so what I want to do is ca use caution when doing this. We do consult IR with our results. We are not speaking for the university. Um, and we, in particular, um, when we have these results that we can use as a positive recommendation, we are not setting policy. We are really trying to find out a way to help more of our students be successful um, in, our, in our neighborhoods in a way. Um, and also, as a caution for our University 101, there may be other compounding factors. These are the ones we looked at over the summer. They're the ones that were determined to be most relevant, but there could be additional ones. So um, on conclusion and ongoing work, um, our modeling work is continuing. Um, we are still waiting for um, the data, particularly on the commuting distance. Uh, this has been something we've wanted to work on for a year and a half, and we finally will be getting some data in the next couple of months that we can look at. Um, we still are asking more questions as we look at this data. Additional questions come up um, that we want to examine bec uh, because it is um, we know that it's a nationally no hard problem of how to um, improve retention, but we're hoping if we can at least get some suggestions that can help the students locally at NKU. So some ongoing work that's going on. Um, the MapWorks tool, um, which is providing flags for students at risk based on known criteria, they're the ones that we've been working with to get the survey data. And we can ask, the, once we receive the survey data from last year, we're part of the team and may be able to ask questions for next year that might help identify um, additional criteria. And we've also, NKU has hired um, a consulting firm who will be looking, um, doing a deep dive into our students' uh, careers through the courses that they've taken and their performance um, to find academic indicators of success. So are there course sequences that students are more successful if they take X before Y? So there's a lot of work going on at the university to help improve our retention. This is but a small part of it. So um, we want to acknowledge a lot of groups that helped us. And this is truly a transdisciplinary team in, the, in that none of us could have done it alone. We've included the tools that we've used um, throughout the talk simply to indicate that none of us are a master on all of these tools. And it really took a team of different people with different strengths and an ability to keep asking questions and not be invested in the results to allow us to get even as far as we have. And we've also had support from a number of groups on campus, including the Burkhart Consulting Center, which employs Casey um, Klotnick, our student, and as a plug, she is also a fourth STEM ambassador. So we have two of our student leaders on this project. Um, our NKU Center of Innovation, Technology, and Education has been very helpful in our helping us do this video today. NKU Institutional Research they anonymized the data for us to make sure that the data was secure. They set up a secure um, drive for us that's to make sure that we are, so, we are up to date on privacy um, and safety issues for the student information. We, don't, we are not aware of, we do not have access to any directly student information. The president's office who provided the seed grant 
Um, we also had an undergraduate research council grant. And of course, the two grants that helped prompt these questions um, because of the bigger problem around retention, the SOAR and STEM and um, STEP grant. This is our team. Um, we had a lot of prior people, and these are our current. This is our contact information. If you'd like to contact us, we have our emails and the two teams from the there. And then with that, I want to thank you, and we'll open up for questions. So can we turn the mics on? All right, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, go ahead, um, if you would like to ask a question, you can type it into the question box, or you can raise your hand, and we can unmute you when you raise your hand and you can ask your question out loud. Helicopters, bachelor, students shooting from one department to another within STEM. So there's a, someone typed a question in. Um, do you want to read it out loud and then respond? Sure. So Ben asked, are there factors that trigger students changing from one department to another? Um, there's all kinds of factors, and it's certainly um, needs to be broken down by department. We're working on that right now on a departmental level. Um, most of the STEM departments have um, introductory uh, seminars, and we have additional IRBs and surveys out for those students to find out what those factors are. But I'm sorry, I mean, other than having close contact with a faculty member, beyond that, I, I don't have answers for it. I'd like to, with respect to the um, C, so I'll give you two answers to that. One, one question is, as a STEM community, we did not necessarily explore why they might switch from one STEM major to another. Um, within the C computer science department, we did um, for computer science and CIT, and it did primarily have to do with the heavier math load required in computer science indicates students tend to change to CIT. Um, so. Hope that answers the question for you. Hmm. You tested your visualization options with policymakers, and if so, what is the most compelling or useful format? That is a good question. Um, we have shared our um, our visualization at our student celebration for student research, and they. They enjoyed our presentation. It has not changed policy yet. Um, I, Tristy can take that. But we're, we're also, as I mentioned, in, in the midst of the implementing our strategic plan. And so our student retention and success implementation team actually was using, in the demonstration that Nathaniel gave, that was the tool that um, we were using. So they seem to like that. And we also are now on these committees that are making these decisions. So when you say the impact on policymakers, is this people from this team, on the major policymaking groups, one of us is on that team. So it is having an impact, if not directly, um, through that. Any other questions? Anybody want to be brave and raise your hand? And Here we go. Oh, here's a question. Have we tried any interventions to try to improve retention? Absolutely. I mean, that's more or less what we work on. Um, so I'll talk. I think a lot of us can talk about that. Um, what the freshman seminar is one way that they've worked on to address um, retention. And um, oh, test. Yeah. Our, yeah. So the. The FORCE grant that Bethany presented um, showed results from interventions that we worked on socially, academically, um, and undergraduate research that did help improve retention when compared to a comparison group. The SOAR scholars also. Um, what, what alarmed us was that we weren't seeing an uptick in our retention across all of STEM due to the subset of students we were working with. Um, so. I don't know if that answered your question. All right, we have the next question. Who wants what data were the hardest to obtain, and what would you like to have had access to? 
Um, none of us really want to answer that question. <laughs> 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 well, we had, a, we had a, a hard time getting the graduation data. So we had this wonderful retention database that show you where students go with the exception of when they graduated. It was the most bizarre thing. And it took a long time, half a year to a year, to get them to link graduation data. Um, and what would we have liked to have had access to? We just got access to MapWorks, and that's the big one I've been waiting for. And then also um, Bessie and Nessie. Yeah, we're still waiting. Yeah, so we're still waiting on Bessie and Nessie. Uh, MapWorks should be the next one we get access to. Okay, the same question. Have you found any visualizations or data analysis tools more compelling for data-driven funding decisions? I think the more dynamic the visualization can be because of the sheer quantity of data, that is the most compelling. Nathaniel showed you that picture, just it was a cluster. It, it, it needs to be dynamic. Yeah, when I think of things that the school has helped fund outside of the grant, one was some UR undergraduate research scholarships one summer where we had data showing these two, the high percentage. And that, that we only used a graph. But I, I know that for getting us on those committees, I think a lot of the, the, the dynamic data where people can see where the students are going. So do you notice that institutional retention fluctuates considerably from year to year? And what factors do you think contribute to those fluctuations? Um, yeah, can you? Yeah. But this is Bethany. Yeah, so I will respond to that really quick. I know that we've been really honing in on the STEM disciplines and seeing uh, retention fluctuate. Our enrollment has continued to increase. And I think, although it's been hard to get evidence about this, in terms of our class size continues to go up as we've increased our enrollment, we've increased our retention, but or increased our recruitment efforts. And so we've had this increasing enrollment, but our retention has gone down. And so I've been doing some things in the classroom as my classes have gotten larger. I've switched to really going to a pure uh, uh, team-based learning where they're working with teams uh, every day for long periods of time with less and less lecturing and more problem-based types of learning and we're gonna we're kind of testing that out to see how that impacts retention because I do think one of the things that we have not addressed with these two grants is instruction and we're, we've got an IE's proposal in right now to drastically change STEM instruction for all of our first-year courses and, and we've been piloting some of that so I think that's uh, kind of one of the directions we're, we're heading in. And actually our institutional retention over time has continued to increase. It's not fluctuating so much up and down, but the six-year graduation rate has continued to increase since 2000. So um, there is some year-to-year -year fluctuation, but over time you can see the increase. We haven't talked about data outside of first-time freshmen. Well, and that's a, a real piece of data that we're continuing to work on our transfer students and students that declare later than like those undeclared students you see and trying to track their movement. But we have a large population of transfer students that um, I think are very successful because our graduate numbers keep going up and up uh, even our, if our retention isn't going up. And so we need to get better data to track, track our transfer students. Okay. Any more questions? Those are lots of great questions. Oh, here's another one from Laura Malay. Have you, oh, it's a long one. Um, have you looked within colleges at specific clusters of STEM courses that students take? And have you noticed that students taking courses sequences, for instance, physics 121, 122, are retained at higher rates than other students? And what about looking at correlations between math, SATs, and STEM retention? So for the first one, no. And that's actually what, I'm, um, for the Physics 121 and 122, the cluster pump Laura, that's actually what the company we hired will be looking at. And that's exactly what they're going to look at, um, is what sequence students take in. So we'll have that information probably within a year. 
We did look at correlations in math, SAT, um, I have within computer science and CIT, and um, we, I did see that students were more successful, but not necessarily retained at a higher rate. They performed better with math SAT scores. Um, so that's the work I'm familiar with. We worked, worked in biology with ACT scores because primarily students in Kentucky take the ACT and we've looked at math and science and overall scores and those have not been strong predictors of student success either. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, it is um, three minutes past the hour, so we should probably end the webinar. Um, we can ask more questions, though, if you have some <laughs> you're about to ask. But um, I want to take this chance to thank this interdisciplinary team from Northern Kentucky University um, for taking the time to share their research and their results on um, using data mining to investigate retention in STEM. I hope that it's been really valuable to all of you. Um, and also we're showing the STEM Central website now on the screen and this is where you will be able to access the webinar, the recording of the webinar. And also within this particular spot on the website you can leave comments, ask additional questions, and we can also post additional resources within this spot. So you can find it by going to um, to webinars, go to past webinars, and then you'll see it listed there at the top. So I encourage you to continue the conversation on STEM Central, and um, I thank all of you, I thank our presenters and our attendees for coming. With that, I think we can um, stop the recording and um, say goodbye. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you.